Thank you very much. Welcome to this special event brought to you by the Wheeler Centre. My name's Peter Mayers. I present the national interest on ABC Radio National. And it's a great honour and a great pleasure to be sharing a stage with Ingrid Betancourt, French Colombian politician, anti corruption crusader, environmentalist, and survivor. Welcome, Ingrid. Thank you so much. Thank you. In 2002, when campaigning to become president of Colombia as leader of the Green Oxygen Party, Ingrid Betancourt was kidnapped by the Revolutionary Armed Forces of Colombia, or FARC. For more than six years, she was held captive in basic and brutal conditions in the Colombian jungle, much of that time chained at the neck. Ingrid has written about her experiences in a harrowing, passionate and gripping memoir, Even Silence Has an End. Ingrid, six and a half years is a long time. Do you still wake up and wonder where you are? Wonder if you're back in the jungle? Well, it happens a lot, actually, to, to just open my eyes and just have this second of, I'm here. No, yeah, that still happened, less than before. So it, just, just the other day you had this? Yes, yes. Here I, I had it, and, and especially I think that when you're traveling and that you wake up in, you know, Strange a hotel in a and, yeah. bedroom that you, doesn't mean anything to, to you in your, I mean, it's new, so you have that kind of little And in your void. dreams? In my dreams I'm getting better and better. I had many um, nightmares during the first two years uh, after my release. But I think that now I'm, I'm just, it's better. Let's go back a bit and describe who you are. You were born in Colombia, but <laughs> raised in France. In 1989, you went back to Colombia to pursue a career in politics. Now, what led you to get involved in Colombian politics? It's not a path many people would sort of <laughs> volunteer for. Um, I think it was the love for my country. I, I was brought up in a family that was concerned with what was happening in Colombia. My father had worked all his life in, in um, giving uh, tools to common people that wouldn't have the financial means to, to study, to be able to, to study abroad, and he created an institution uh, for them to have uh, loans and credits to, to study abroad. So it was something that he was always thinking uh, about how to make people, you know, live up to their dreams. And my mother, she, she was 18 when she founded a um, shelter for abandoned children. It was before she met my father. And I think it was a couple that had that in common. They, they you know, they wanted to have a, a Colombia that would be a better place to live. So we were brought up in this, in, this, um, in this frame of mind. And I think that what triggered everything is that uh, when I was living in France and I was married with the f father of my children, which is a f French man, um, my mother was in Colombia and she was um, campaigning for this uh, presidential candidate. And this was an extraordinary man, Luis Carlos Galán. It was a guy with... Uh, ideals and, and in, in, in a country like Colombia which is dominated by violence, corruption, um, mafia values, drug cartels, etc. And he was killed, but, but the way he was killed uh, was something that became personal because uh, he had to address uh, during his presidential campaign, um, you know, Colombians in uh, in the outskirts of Bogota, there was this huge gathering. And he had to come to a stage like this, and there were some stairs to just come and, and you know, talk to, to the people. And my mother was just behind him, and he, she was wearing high heels. And when she tried to, to climb the stairs, she fell down because of her high heels. And in the precise moment she fell down, uh, the, the snipers that were of course, of the mafia that were that killed Luis Carlos Galan, just browsed the stage with fire, and she was saved miraculously. 
So, you know, it make, made an impact in me in the sense that I thought I should be there. I mean, what I'm doing here should be where, where they're struggling. A lot of people would have the exact opposite response. <laughs> <laughs> They'd say, here you have, you know, a, a, a politician who's willing to stand up against corruption and the mafia and the drugs in Colombia and look what happens to him. Um, but you went back and, and you initially ran for parliament and I think you made a point of, of running a clean campaign that is not, uh, not one based on money politics. Is yeah, right? it was a huge um, challenge. Um, and, and I had to be creative. So I did something that my father hated, which was giving condoms in the street to, of course, but it was kind of, you know, uh, limit. But, but the idea was to, to say to people, look, uh, the same way we have to protect ourselves against AIDS, which is, you know, it's a battle, we have to protect ourselves against corruption. And so we have to be responsible. And uh, if you vote for me, it's like wearing a condom. I mean... <laughs> I mean, at least, at least it made people laugh. That was the... <laughs> Condoms against corruption. I, I, I like it. Um, so you, you were elected to the House of Representatives and then to the Senate? Yes. And the Senate, I think, with more votes than any other candidate in that yes. election. And your party was called the Green Oxygen Party. It's a strange name. What's, what does well, it mean? not strange when you're in Colombia and you're in, the, in politics and you cannot breathe because it's so... I mean, it stinks. Really, I mean, it was difficult to be in that period in Colombia. We, we had had a huge scandal with uh, the president that had been elected uh, re receiving financing by the drug cartels. And the, the whole parliament was, um, of course, there were exceptions. Whenever I say this, I hear my bell ringing. Not everybody, no, not everybody. But let's say that the system allowed for, for those kind of friendship with, with uh, illegal or it, it sort of corrupt fost or... fostered those alliances yes, with, those between alliances. the drug money, the mafia exactly. and politicians. Yeah. And from the Senate you ran for president. How did you end up? You, went, you were taken hostage on the 23rd of February 2002 you went on a trip to a place called San Vicente, which is in FARC-controlled territory, or at least disputed territory, I guess. No, it wasn't really that. I mean, this was the place where the, the peace talks had been held with the FARC. I mean, mm. the FARC and the government were sitting at a table, and the government to... Um, I, I, I think to, to, to uh, grant like a uh, security area to, to the FARC in order for them to feel at ease negotiating with the, with the government uh, gave the FARC this whole territory and it was big, it was the size of Switzerland and in that zone, that it, it was called the demilitarized zone um, the army was not allowed to enter the, the, the police either and it was under the control of the FARC while they were discussing in order to feel that they could be safe. Mm. But two days prior to my trip, uh, the, the peace process ended abruptly. And of course, the president at that time was um, under lots of pressure because people were saying in Colombia that he had given too much to the FARC and that it was going to be a problem now that the peace talks had ended to recover the control over the zone. So he had granted 48 hours to the FARC to just evict the zone. And this had been done by launching a huge military operation called Tanatos, where, I mean, they had to go or they had to go. I mean, and when I arrived to Florencia, which was the place in that zone where I had to take the road to go to San Vicente in car. Um, well, there, there was soldiers everywhere. It was a huge, huge military presence. And that same day, at that same 
place the president decided to go to uh, held a, a um, press conference in order to just prove to Colombian people and to the world, because it was international press with lots of journalists, to prove that it was so safe and it was under control, that he had recovered the control of the zone, that he himself was going to send his end. I don't know what happened, but everything went wrong. And, and probably because he thought that it was in the opposition and he didn't want to have the noise of that voice, or, or for whatever reason, I, I really don't know. But the fact is, that when I was going to just take, you know, all the, the there was this kind of security plan that we had um, organized in order for me to go from Florencia to San Vicente. Uh, he gave the order to my uh, escorts not to come with me. So he basically withdrew your security detail. He withdrew my security. So here I was with my my committee and and, and I had had this phone call from the mayor of San Vicente saying, Ingrid, please, you have to come. This is a very difficult moment for us. And he was a, a Green Party member. He was one of your party and you, one, you wanted to support him. And I wanted to support him. So I thought, I, I have to be there. And then the other thing that really, I mean, pushed me to go was that uh, I thought, if I just accept that every time the government will want me not to go somewhere, he will withdraw my security and then I won't go. He will be, I mean, the government will be controlling my campaign. So you had to make a stand. You felt you had to take a stand. Uh, yeah, yeah. And? And I took the road. And that day, um, there was a military checkpoint. And in that military checkpoint, they checked our identity and they led us through. And this is an important detail because afterwards, and once I was captured, the government of Colombia probably, you know, fearing that this could backfire on, on them in the sense that people would say they withdrew the security so they are responsible for the abduction, they, they just rewrote the story. The fact is that we went through this checkpoint like everybody else. I mean, it was not like if it was closed and then they granted a special permission to us to go. No, everybody was going through this checkpoint. Uh, there were militaries all over the place, soldiers, Black Hawks, helicopters flying on top of us. They were uh, doing the shuttle between Florence and San Vicente. Every 30 minutes there, there was a Black Hawk, you know, um, uh, leaving for, for San Vicente. Well, it was really it, the, the appearance of everything was, that the zone was very secure, like never before. And I had been in the zone many, many times. So I think that nobody could foresee that the FARC would be as audacious as to install a roadblock there. I mean, and they did. And that's how I just fall in the trap. Now, the, the incredible thing I remember that day is that w when I saw the guys, because there were so many troops all over the place, I didn't. N n I, it was difficult for me to know if they were soldiers or you know or or who they were. So I looked at the boots because they had told me that the difference. They all had the same kind of camouflage, kind of camouflage jungle uniform, uniform exactly. Yeah. So they said the only way you will recognize them is that the soldiers have leather boots. And the guerrillas and paramilitaries, they have rubber boots. So when you saw the boots, you knew yeah. you were in trouble. I was in problem, yeah. And what did, did you think at first? I mean, you, as you say, you'd been involved in peace negotiations with the FARC. You knew some of their leaders. Did you think, well, this will, we'll, we'll be able to sort this out at first? I, think it, I thought it was a mistake. You know, I had been talking with these guys two weeks before. In, in this table of negotiation with all the other presidential candidates. And I had had all the high members of the FARC, the, 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 the chiefs, the commanders, um, talking with me. We had lunch. Uh, we joked about things. Uh, we talked about, of course, politics, their agenda, our agenda. It was something that, I mean, when, when they captured me, I thought this is a mistake. Whenever the, the, the commanders will know it's me, they will release me. 
but no, they they really were meaning. Uh, and and they, they, they decided you were valuable, I guess. They decided I was valuable. I think that at first they thought this this is a coup and and we're going to be able to negotiate to get back to it because that territory was import, important for them. So I think that perhaps they said this is going to be our, you know, our way to, to force the government to get back to the, to the table or perhaps they just thought what they said which was we're going to exchange her for prisoners that we have in the, in the, in the jails in Colombia and we're going to trade her. But I think that after a while they decided it was better to just keep us, which is a better deal because it gave them like a, a, an international media uh, exposure. Well, that raises some very interesting questions about the sort of politics of hostage taking and hostage release. We might come to those in a moment, but I think I should ask you first about who the FARC are. Good question. Um, I can tell about what I saw. It's, it's a military organization. They have rules, they have, you know, their uh, inside laws. Um, I didn't see much of uh, political discussions and I don't feel, nor the troop, the, there were young peasants that were recruited uh, as far guerrillas, nor the commanders had really a, um, in, a, a, a true interest for politics. I thought that was something that they didn't like too much. They liked the, the military part of, of the struggle, but not to just think about... So, so it was kind of, you know, for me it was kind of disappointed in, in a way because they were, you know, advertising themselves as revolutionaries. An alternative government. So, An alternative yeah. government, communist. And what I saw was a, a group that a very uh, hierarch hierarchic. Uh, organization, but with privileges, which also was kind of, you know, annoying because they were supposed to just be communists, so share supposed everything. To be egalitarian. Yeah. Egalitarian, and no, this was, you wanted to be a commander because this would give you access to better food, better uh, clothes, toys, money, women, things that were and the, the, the core of the thing is that I think that once they, they decided they were going to allow themselves to finance the organization through drugs, which was, it's what they do, I think they became a drug cartel, really. Sorry. I mean, the mentality just changed. And I was impressed on how skillful they were, they knew about the job, and they were really into it. When, wherever we would go, we were, you know, just going through. We were, of course, marching into the jungle. But the point where we were making the transitions from one sector to the other was were always coca fields. Always coca fields. Coca, mm. coca, 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 all the time in the jungle. So entirely drug finance. Yes. Yeah. And many of the guerrillas that your guards were in fact children. Yes, they were children. They were the youngest I remember I, I had as a guard was a boy that I think was 12, 13 at the most. And uh, they were between, yes, 14 and 18. That was the range of ages. So they were really adolescents. And um, obviously your, your treatment varied. Uh, I mean, you've moved into several different camps. You're on the road a lot. You're, well, on the road, let's say, in the jungle, on foot, marching, and different places you were treated differently according to who, whose command you came under. But you also had very different guards, didn't you? I mean, with some guards you developed, well, not a friendship exactly, but... I guess. We, could, we could say it was kind of a friendship. I think that, you know, we, we were in this situation where, in a way, they were, they were the bad guys and we were the good guys, you know. But yeah, that's pretty clear, I think. <laughs> but, 
but, but truly, it was not really like this, because I could see good and bad over that side and good and bad over this side, you know. Uh, so I think it was, it was for, for some of them, it was difficult to just accept or, or find a way to, to um, admit what they were doing. I mean, the, the, I saw conflict of conscience in, in some of them. Of course, they were brainwashed every day. They had this kind of councils or, you know, uh, assemblies, and the commander would, you know, address them and would make sure that they were, you know, clear that what they were doing was okay. But it, it, it was, I, I don't think it was so obvious. And the other thing was that there was also a pattern of, of uh, behavior. Uh, those groups would change, you know, they would change guards and groups and commanders, probably because it was hard to be, I mean, 100% of the time with prisoners, it's challenging, isolated in the jungle, less food, I mean. And um, whenever the, the group was, like, new, there was this kind of, they wanted to know about us, they, they asked questions and things, but very quickly there was this, degradation of, of the relationship, and they could become really aggressive and, and humiliating. And, and there was this, then like it was like the bad in them just, you know, came apparent because they were under pressure, there was the group pressure that was immense. Uh, they were told that they had to be rough on us because of course if, if any of us would escape, they could, you know, be executed. I mean, there was a lot of pressure. Mm. And were, I mean, some you, with some you discussed. I mean, these were these were kids the same age as your children. Yes, you they did. were the same age as my children. And I always was thinking, what have? I mean, you, you know, life. I mean, my children could have been born in conditions where their choice was. I mean, to, to, to go to the guerrilla. And even if I knew that they were deeply good in them, how the situation could have turned them to be. I was always thinking about the horrible options these kids had to face in their lives. Some of the girls, for example, because a lot of women guerrillas yes. that would say, well, they'd, they had worked in a bar before that and, and you knew what that meant and yes. that the, the FARC was preferable. Yes, of example. course. I mean, between prostitution uh, and, you know, being in an organization with a rifle, with uniform, feeling that they could make themselves respect in front of civilians because they were... It was an option for them. And, and misery. Those were kids that would sometimes narrate to me situations of, I mean, of hunger. These guys could, I mean, days without eating in the jungle because nothing was growing or they couldn't, I mean, that was the situation. I mean, poverty, extreme poverty. So, of course, the FARC, FARC was an option because they're, they would eat every day. Rice and beans, but every day. Better than nothing. Yes. You talk about us, and of course you weren't alone as a hostage. And in fact, I, I guess in some ways, I mean, there's so much in your book, but one of the key strands in the book is about your relationship, the relationship between you and the other hostages. And at times, that was extremely difficult, wasn't it? Yes, it um, was extremely difficult for all of us. For all of us. I mean, we were, we were forced to live in a very s small space, um, having to share everything with people we didn't know. And we didn't want to be there, none of us. And it was difficult. We, we were in a situation where I, our identity was denied. So all the conflicts that arises with those kind of, you know, um, traumas. So I think it, it was, you know, it was the, the best space to have all the bad come up in all of us. Uh, so all the bad was there, but 
all the good too, which was incredible. And that for me is what I just, you know, try to, 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 to bring up because um, I, I saw incredible things uh, of m gestures and attitudes of solidarity and love and, and heroism. Devotion. I mean, things that f for me are, y you see, I, I think that one of the things that was very important at that time was when I was thinking that someday I would be able to just get out of there. And I was thinking, the day this will happen, that I will be free, I need to be able to look at my face in a mirror and feel okay. You know, the, the problem is the shame. When, when, when you are in situations where the choices that you have to make are so difficult, you have to be careful not to make the bad choice that could be the good choice in the moment, but could be the bad choice in perspective. Like, as some of your fellow hostages did, carrying uh, favor with the guards, betraying fellow hostages in order to get an extra ration or something, you know, some extra privileges, that sort of thing. Yes, that sort of thing. And, and things also like, for example, I mean, I will always think of, of this because I think it's so, it marked me so much. Uh, it, it was uh, uh, the first night we were together in this horrible place. It was a, a concentration camp they had built in the middle of nowhere. I mean, uh, barbed wires, fences, watchtowers. Um, it was really a very horrible place. And the shock to just get there and have that door, huge metal door, just shutting behind you. And, and you're there, you're trapped, you're a prisoner, but you know that there's, I mean, no, you're not a prisoner. You, you, are, you are kidnapped. And... Um, that was our first night, and we were all very, you know, under the shock. And then in the morning, there was two guys came the other side of the fence and shouted, number yourselves. But, I mean, it was very scary. That was, everybody was like startled. Number yourself as in count yourself off. It was a roll, uh, roll yeah, call. Roll call, but I didn't understand at the beginning because it didn't make sense to me. And then I saw that the, the prisoner, the hostage that was near the fence said one and then there was a second said two and so on and so forth. And when it came to me that I had listened to what they were doing and every time they were giving a number I was like feeling so bad. I was saying no, we, we cannot accept this. So I said Ingrid Betancourt and then there was this you know, very aggressive attitude from the guards. And then I said, look, I, I tried to explain myself. And I said, it's, if you want to know if I'm here, you just call me by my name and I will answer. But the, the thing that always struck me in, in this uh, story is that in a way the guards just, you know, they let the thing go. But after that, my companions were so aggressive against me saying, who do you think you are? You think you are like a diva because people talk about you in the radio? You think that you cannot give them a number? You think that you're better than us? And it was difficult for me to explain to them why it was so crucial not to accept to be... And you know what? I, I remember when I, when I reacted, thinking about the numbers they would put on, on the skin, in, 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 in the, of the Jews of, in Nazi Germany. Yeah, yes. Yeah. So it was for me very, very, it was very strong. And, um, well, that's what I mean, you know. Th there are moments where you, 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 you have to make a choice. And you know that the choice is not going to be the good one in the moment. Because, of course, then the retaliation, everybody was scared that they would punish us. I mean, it was a deal. But... For me, it was like, okay, I did what I needed to do. Well, and you were defiant throughout uh, in ways that often your fellow hostages resented. Uh, 
but also incredibly brave. I mean, you tried to escape five times. Um, and at one, one point, uh, I suppose the most dramatic and the, well, the couple that were almost successful, you actually used the river, didn't you, to, yes. to try and escape. Just explain how you, how you thought, I mean, you spent ages planning this and preparing for it. Explain how you tried to escape. And I became so good at it that I trained one of my companions and he succeeded in, ex in escaping. It was amazing. Well, the thing was that, of course, every time I was recaptured, I had this horrible feeling of, of depression and of, it was really physical. And I would think to, to, you know, to just hold together, I would think it it doesn't matter, I'm in a learning process. I have to learn how to survive in this jungle and next time I will succeed. So it's true that every time I was, you know, getting better at the job. Um, so for me, one of the things that I realized is that the longer we were in the jungle, the deeper they would move us into. So after three years in the jungle, we knew we could not get to civilization the next day or after a week. I mean, it was... If we were, were lucky, it could mean month or three months. Or so. The, what I thought was that if we could go to the river and let ourselves um, take by the current, that would have the advantage of not leaving traces anywhere. Uh, the speed would, of course, just help us in, in getting away because it was easier to be in the water than to try to walk in, in, in the jungle because of the vegetation that is so dense. And that because, the, the, of course, the, the river is like a, a highway in the jungle. Somewhere in that river, we would find civilians. That was my bet. So... We prepared everything. I remember, you know, um, uh, in secret, uh, sewing backpacks with whatever we had, with the boots of our pants or whatever, to be able to, 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 to bring things with us. And, and what we would bring was a little thing to eat for the first days. Um, it was all a strategy to be able to get hold of um, fish hooks and um, fishing line yes and, and everything was calculated in that sense for example I remember uh, I, I, I thought that we needed flotation devices so the only thing that I thought was they had this um, where they would uh, bring the uh, oil uh, for cooking yeah mm. And, well, and drums, yeah. the drums. And so once the, they were empty, they would throw it away or we would ask them so that we could carry water uh, to, the, to the camp and save water because we were always camping not too near to, to, to the river to wash our hands or our teeth or whatever. And then that was the flotation device. So you use these to jump yes. into the river and, and, you, and, and you, float. you and one of your colleagues did this for yes. several days before... Yes. You're eventually, it's, it's a, a gripping story. Yes. Uh, I want to come back before we, we'll go in a moment to some questions from the audience, but a couple of things I wanted to, to touch on before we did that. One was your relationship to the jungle, because the jungle in many ways was your captor as well as the FARC and your tormentor in terms of uh, bugs, insects, dangerous animals, diseases, malaria, leechmaniasis, other terrible diseases, but you also managed to find beauty and solace in the jungle. Yes. I think that uh, the relationship with the jungle is a lot like the relationship with everybody. It's like it was the contrast. I mean, it was never black and white. It was like with the guards. Some were nice, the others were horrible, or, or they would, you know... Same with my companions. Some were nice, others were more difficult, etc. And the jungle, um, I had this impression that I was trapped in this nature, that it was so impossible to get out. And, and it was 
uh, the jungle was aggressive to me uh, because everything was, was painful in the jungle. For example, I don't remember a day of my captivity without scratching myself. I was always itching, always I had bugs in the... It was always a problem. But sometimes the jungle became a protector, especially when we were escaping. I mean, it was the jungle that was preserving us from being caught again. And for example, the river, the river, of course, uh, when, when we would escape in the river, we had to do it at night. So at night, a river is like very black, and you have in your head all the things that are in the river. <laughs> the piranhas, the anacondas, the crocodiles, And I want to tell you that, and ladies, you will understand that, that I was, when I was escaping, one of my, you know, I mean, concerns was not to be in the D-Day because I didn't want to have the piranhas. <laughs> you understand? Okay. So those kind of things were, were kind of tricky. I mean, to just, you know. So uh, the, 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 the jungle was for me an ally in some moments and then... It was uh, an enemy in some others. But with, with time, I also discovered that there was in the jungle that I hated at the beginning because I was a city girl, you know. I, I didn't feel that that was the place for me. I ended up by feeling like a connection with, with, with nature that soothed my pain and that gave me a pace and, and sometimes a rhythm to my thoughts and some kind of harmony and peace that for me were essential to just not turn into a crazy person because one of the things that I saw around me were behaviors that were limited with schizophrenia around the persons that were in captivity with me. We were always, I mean, you could see the verge of the nervous breakdown. There was always this very tiny limit. And I think that the jungle for me just helped me. I should point out, just going back to the piranhas, that the piranhas didn't eat you, you ate the piranhas. Yes, that's true. Raw. Yes, yes. Well, with a, when I could fish in, in that, it was funny because I, had, I, I was with this guy, my friend that I adore, Lucho, and, and he was a diabetic. And we decided that we needed to run away and to escape. So once we did it, and I will go, it, he, he was an incredible human being. So we were there and I was catching fish. And miraculously, we caught lots of fish. So it was like, wow, we're going to survive. I mean, we're going to make it. If we catch all those fishes in one day, I mean, we can be living here, you know. And then we couldn't light a fire. <laughs> we did everything. But the, and I was thinking, you didn't learn how to light a fire, Lucho? <laughs> and he would say, I suppose you had learned. And we, we, we were like... We, we couldn't do it. All that planning. All that planning, and we, we didn't learn how to do this. So I remember he said, no, I'm not going to eat this. And I was thinking, he's diabetic, he needs to eat, because then we're going to be in problem he, he went, if he comes into a coma, in a diabetic coma. So I just cut the fish the best I could, and I presented to him like in a leaf, and I said, look, Lucho, this is delicious. These are sushis. <laughs> And I remember him looking at me like, I was like, hmm, so good. <laughs> and yeah. finally he, he, he yes. managed to eat them. Yeah. There's a couple of uh, microphones, one at, for, the, uh, for our audience upstairs and one in the middle here, which someone's just going to put in place. And so if you'd like to ask a question, I'd ask you to go to the microphone. I'm just going to ask Ingrid one more. And this comes back to something we touched on earlier, the politics of hostage taking and hostage release. Because on the one hand, the, it was in the interest of the Colombian government to forget about you. Because if there was no fuss about you, your value as a hostage declined 
and therefore they might have been more able to do a deal with FARC to exchange you, or you stop being a problem, I guess, for everyone. But on the other hand, the government of France, your family, your friends campaigning kept your name in the media, kept the issue alive after all these years, and in a sense that played into the hands of FARC because that increased your value to them. So there's a, there's a real dilemma here, isn't there? In the, not know, for me. No? <laughs> no, not for me. Not for me. I, I, I want to tell you that from all the group we were, uh, at what point we were 68, two soldiers uh, succeeded to, to escape and they were recaptured, like I was recaptured, and they were executed and I wasn't. So for me, the, the uh, being alive in, in, in the thought of others, having people all around the world campaigning for, for, for release, I mean, it was my, I, I, I'm alive because of people that were backing me up. Now, the, the other thing is thinking that uh, governments will negotiate when um, the, the value of the people will be less important, and that's not true. Governments negotiate for their interests, their personal interests. None, they never think about the lives of others. Twenty of my fellow hostages are today still in captivity. Nobody knows their names. They're, they don't interest anyone. And if that was the logic, they should be out, because those guys have been there for 12 years, 12 years, they were there before I was abducted and they're still there now. And they are not, excuse me because this is horrible to say, but like important. And I, I it's so, and, and it's very sad for, for all of us because you see, once the, the, the big bunch of us came to be free, once uh, the FARC uh, freed some of us, with the help of Hugo Chavez, that was the negotiation prior to our uh, to the military operation that freed me and my companions. And once we that bunch was out, I think that people thought, okay, that's done. I mean, we don't. Our job is over. And and there's no. I, I don't think there is a a um, pressure for the government to just have them out, or for the FARC. The FARC. They, can, they are drug traffickers. They can have those guys forever in the jungle. They can feed them, they can feed the people, excuse me, to, to, to uh, guard them. And th they feel that they are, you know, it's like a disguise to pretend they are, they have political, a political drive. That's not true. I mean, w what is the purpose of having people 12 years in the jungle without no negotiation. Okay, we'll take a question from the top, first of all. Please go ahead. Thank you. I'm interested, interested to know what sustained you during your captivity. Love. Love is the answer, always. And in, uh, I'm going to tell you this in a very basic uh, way. I was surrounded by people that hated me. And when people hate you in a daily basis, your identity is shaken to the point that you think perhaps I'm not worthy of being loved. And if you think that, you're in problem because then you're going to begin giving up on yourself. And then you enter to uh, identity crisis that can lead to, to the loss of your dignity. And when you lose dignity as a human being, you lost who you are. You, 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 you lose yourself as a human being. So for me, in, in those moments of despair, I would go back in, 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 in my head and I would just focus on those incredible moments of love that I received from my parents, of love with my children. And that kept me together. My mother, uh, during those six and a half years, sent messages through the radio. There, there are programs in Colombia that broadcast messages 
from the families of the hostages without knowing if those messages are going to be heard by, by the our hostages. And she did it on a daily basis, every day. That was crucial for me because it was the only way I could remind myself who I was through her love. So we need love. I mean, that's the only thing I can tell you. I mean, we need love. We need to give love. We need to receive love. That's our... I just want to follow up with a couple of other things. Um, I mean, those radio messages are an incredibly important part, obviously, of the book. Um, but there's two other things I'd, I'd ask you about in relation to what sustained you. One would be faith, because sometimes you had access to a Bible, and I think that was important to you. And the other was occupying yourself to defeat what you call the, the poison of boredom. Yes. Um, well, faith is the greatest version of love. So it's just, it's, you know, this very powerful tool that we have in ourselves to just have the certainty that we are loved from this, you know, however you want to call what I called God. And so that you're not in a chaos situation. There's a purpose, there's a meaning, there's whatever problem you encounter in life, and we all do. We all have difficult moments. We all have uh, difficult decisions to make. We all have... Um, if we think that whatever we are confronting is an opportunity to grow, to learn something about ourselves, to amend, to transform, to just get a, to be a better person, then things fall into place and, 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 and you can confront, confront things in a very posit, positive way. Now, the, the, the problem of boredom was that it was the way for depression. So we had to keep our minds busy. And in a place where there's nothing to do, it's kind of difficult. So what, what we did, and I, for me that was essential, was to build up a schedule every day. Uh, from 9 a.m. to 11, I will be working out. So that was like devoted to that. Then from three to four, I will be reading. And from six to nine, I will be listening to the radio. And even though there was not so much to do, the idea that I could just like fragment the days into pieces that gave me the, the sensation that I could just face what was truly the torture of being captured, which was not knowing when this would end, like the eternity of, of captivity in front of me. Okay, question from the... Hola, Beatriz. Um, I've got two questions. One of them is, how would you keep record on the days that you kept um, kidnapped? And the other one was, if you had the chance chance to change anything or make another decision to avoid the situation that you were into, um, whether you change or not. So the first part of that question is, you've written this book, how did you keep a record of what happened to you or how did you recall the events? We had radios, so we could, um, w we could know, we could have a record of the day. Um, but of course, for me, what helped me in reconstructing everything that I remembered was through milestones that I kept during all those years. Those milestones were the birthday of my children. Those days, I always wanted to make it different in a way that I would where I was, what I was thinking, and what I was doing in the day Melanie turned to be 17, then 18, then 19, then 20, then 21, then 22. And I can remember exactly for each of her birthday where I was. The same for, my, for, for Lorenzo. Then I had the, um, the uh, Christmas and, and New Year's Eve. And with Christmas, 
what happened is that the change of, of camp helped me in just knowing what Christmas it was because we never had a Christmas like the previous one, even though there was this kind of decision taken by, by the FARC not to celebrate Christmas because it was a religious um, date. So Christmas was nothing. To Counter-revolutionary. Like Very, yes. Mm. I'll, I'll take another question. Yeah. Sorry. <laughs> Hello. Um, I just finished your book and I really liked it. Um, I, but I have just one question about it. I, I really love all the ideas that you have like with fear, with angry, with all that things that humans feel. And then what I don't understand is why then you sue Colombia? And it's just a question, it's not I'm just, uh, why do you sue Colombia and then you withdraw? Yeah, thank you for the question. I really thank you for that. Well, this is very Colombian things. We're gonna be a little bit into uh, uh, home, home politics. Um, in Colombia, there is a law that was enacted before we were freed. To, to, that was enacted to protect the victims of terrorism, because of course Colombia is dealing with lots of terrorism. And that law stipulated that victims of terrorism could come to the government and ask for compensation. And this is done in a very, you know, like a table where um, if you have the, the, na the, the number of days, the people that were involved, if you have two or three or four or five children, your father, your mother, etc. And this gives like a, a table of how much you could be compensated by the government. Uh, my fellow hostages that were abducted at the same time as me or before me uh, presented their uh, compensation uh, uh, claim and nobody talked about it. But when I presented mine, the government of Colombia did a huge scandal about it. The first thing they said was that I was suing the soldiers that had liberated me. The second thing they said was that I wanted to get rich with my abduction. So it has been a little difficult for me to swallow this because it was a law that, that was available for all of us. Other of my fellow hostages after me had presented their claim and, and nothing has been said. Um, I think there was something going on that has nothing to do with the defamation that took place, which is that at that time I was very high in the polls. And I think that some politicians in Colombia were kind of nervous. That is my explanation. Perhaps I'm wrong, but it's the only way I can figure out why the vice president of Colombia said what he said, uh, making this huge scandal about something that was a right of a victim to do. I was treated like a criminal. I mean, I want to tell you that in Colombia we have had huge criminals. Uh, Pablo Escobar is not the, the worst of them. We have had people that have slaughtered thousands of peasants with mass graves that have been opened to, to the public and, and, and this is, has been going on and on for years. None of them had been insulted like I was. So, what to make about this? First, um, well, money is not an issue. That's why I just withdraw, withdraw the, the, the claim for compensation. Because, I mean, I, I'm free. You know, for me, freedom and being with my children and with my mother is my blessing. I'm grateful for that. I withdraw my claim because also the answer was clear. I mean, I was, 
I was coming to, to the state of Colombia as a victim, to just be acknowledged as a victim. And my response was that I was a criminal. I don't need any compensation. My answer is there. I mean, the Colombian society is, is, is hard. And, and the values they convey are not the, viol- the values I cherish and I defend. Well, um, it has been very traumatic for, for my family and for me. Very unjust. Um, I hope we will change. That that the hearts of Colombian people will change, and that will be, we will have more compassion, and we will be able to just, you know, be, be, be able to just feel the, the pain of others. Now, this story, I have to link it with another one, which I think it's important, especially to to answer completely your question. Um, one of the issues that was uh, brought up was the idea, I mean, once I was abducted and the Colombian government at the time, which was not the same as the one that liberated me, but the other one, the previous one, once I was abducted because they had withdrawn my security and were nervous of the consequences of this decision, they just said that I was responsible for my abduction, that I was warned that this was a dangerous place and that I was uh, uh, asked not to go where I was going, and that I did it because I wanted to have uh, a higher score in the polls. So after six years, that thing, I mean, it didn't make sense. The election was over by then, I think. (laughs) Come on, I mean. But once I presented the claim, they just brought this up again. And they said, how dare she ask for compensation when she wanted to be abducted? Okay, we'll have one one more question. Hi, Ingrid. It's a pleasure to have you here. Um, I'm from Colombia, and I guess that as all the Colombians, they want peace, and they wanted to have it without killing each other. However, I just keep thinking, how the guerrilla will stop to do what they are doing if they have the business, if you can call it business, that give more money, guns, kidnap, and drugs. You have been, or you were there for six and a half years. I get that you hear what they talk, how they think, and what they believe. Do you think that is something that can make them go and have conversation with the government for peace? That's the question. Um, This this government that we have today in Colombia is a new government. The president's name is Juan Manuel Santos. And the first thing he did when he came into office was proposing to the FARC to come back to the negotiation table and begin again a peace process. No answer from the FARC. So... Why do they reject negotiation? Two options. They don't have anything to negotiate because their aim is not to have a political agenda with things that they could, you know, fight for, but they are just protecting their way of life, which is lots of money, lots of arms, power in some territories, um, and, and that's a better living for them than to just, you know, get back to to civil, normal life. Or they are divided inside of the organization and they don't want to negotiate because there's not a voice and there's not a unifying structure that will, you know, prevent them in a negotiation process not to just uh, explode internally. In those two cases, I don't think we have left many choices. Because if they don't want to negotiate because they are 
a drug cartel and they don't have a political drive anymore, or if they don't want to negotiate because they cannot, there is not a commander that has the, the sufficient authority to just pull everybody together and make them obey the decision of negotiation. In, in, in those two cases, I'm afraid that the only solution we have left is to confront them uh, with military um, uh, forces. And this is so sad because I don't believe in... I mean, you see, the problem is that behind the no negotiation is let's dream for a moment that we're going to defeat the FARC and we just wipe out the, the FARC from the face of Colombia. The problem is that the problem will remain. We have six million displaced people in Colombia. We have a horrible war, economic war going on, which is this kind of business of the warlords to uh, just steal the land from the peasants in Colombia. And this has been going on since Bolivar. I mean, people of Colombia, very humble people, trying to make a living, and they just go to the jungle, what we call the agriculture frontier, and they just cut some trees and make the land usable. And once it's made usable, and perhaps they have the chance of having a little road or something getting into their parcel, then the warlords come, they, uh, under threat, oblige them to leave, and because of corruption, that land is, um, the deed is transferred to one of the big corrupt warlords that we have in Colombia. So this is a huge problem. So even if you defeated the FARC, the conditions would create another FARC. If we FARC. don't change the way we are, because this is a problem of greed. In Colombia, we never, like today, we have had this amount of concentration of, of land in so small amount of hands. There are, I don't know how many, but very few families in Colombia are the owners of millions of hectares of land. This is the greed. Ingrid Betancourt's book, Even Silence Has an End, is on sale in the foyer. And in a moment, Ingrid will come back and be at the table here to sign copies for any, anyone who would like to have their copy signed up here on stage. But for now, I'm sorry we don't have time for more questions. I'd like to thank you in the audience for attending, and please join me in thanking Ingrid Pettencourt. <laughs>